All right. Previously, in this chapter, chapter six, we've been talking about work and energy, specifically kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, work, and the first law of thermodynamics. You're going to need to remember these things for any of what we're about to do to make any sense whatsoever. What we're going to do right now is motivate some expressions for all of these things. So we want to, we're going to discover that kinetic energy is going to be one half mv squared for an object of mass m moving with speed v. The gravitational potential energy is going to be mgy for an object of mass m, a distance y, a vertical distance y above some point that we've defined to be the zero in our problem. And the elastic potential energy is going to be one half kx squared, where k, something new we haven't talked about yet, the spring constant, defines the stiffness of a spring, how hard it is to stretch or compress it. And x is going to be that stretch or compression, how much we have stretched it or compressed it. Compressed it. Our goal is to be able to use these and get all of this stuff into our first law of thermodynamics so we can make problems a little more interesting. Now, let's add some detail here. Let's say, if I have a five kilogram object held two meters above the ground, how much gravitational potential energy does it have? Well, we could just go use that equation we had talked about a second ago, but let's try to figure out how we got it. So if I lift this thing two meters at, you know, a negligible and constant speed, negligible and constant so we can ignore any energy that went into a kind of the motion of it so we don't we're not doing any work to speed it up and we had to clearly to move it but if i move it very very slowly that amount of energy doesn't really matter so we're going to just ignore it so i'm lifting this thing at constant speed these forces should be balanced and if it goes from zero gravitational potential energy to some gravitational potential energy then well that work had to come from me. So, I can look at this. I can go back to our definition of work. That work is the force times the displacement. I know the work I'm doing, that's this, is just equal to the weight of the object, the force of gravity on it. I've lifted it a distance h. And so, this distance right here, The work that I did is mgh, and we just said the work that I did is equal to the, gra the final gravitational potential energy. So in general, we're going to say that the gravitational potential energy is mgy, and y, because I, sorry, never mind, um, y is the height of the system, the height of the object rather, above some zero in the coordinate system. So usually that's going to be the lowest point in the system. All right, how about kinetic energy? Consider pushing a cart with constant force. So I'm pushing it with some force F by me on the cart. And now it's starting with, not really moving, ends with some final velocity. So if it's not moving, has no kinetic energy to start, it ends with some kinetic energy. And again, the work that I did had to be that kinetic energy. So we're gonna do something kind of similar to what we just did a second ago but it's gonna be a little different. So we're gonna start with our definition of work. And now, are you mad? W mad? I don't know. Anyway, what I'm doing here is just saying that the only force on it is the one that I'm applying, so then that has to be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. But what I'm really interested in is this AD thing. I feel like I've seen the acceleration times the distance before, and if you can see the blue ink over there that I didn't quite manage to scroll off, you may remember why. Here is that same AD. So I'm gonna do a couple of things here. I'm gonna start with this kinematic equation, which is good for constant acceleration, so it's good for constant force. Now, you might wonder what happens if I apply any old general force and keep changing things up? That is an excellent question that we'll answer in AP Physics. So stay tuned. I'm gonna do a little bit of algebra. I'm gonna move this initial velocity, which I've now used the I and the F since that's kind of how we're doing things right now. Um, I'm going to divide this 2 over, so I have AD, the thing that I want, is equal to 1 half the quantity V final squared minus V initial squared. I'm going to just bring that right over here. So now instead of mad, I'm me half viv. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue as well. Uh, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. 
and distribute the mass through it. And so now I have the work that I did is equal to 1 half mv final squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. And I saw that the work way back up here, my work was equal to the change in kinetic energy. It went from nothing to something. So these two terms, this, the work must be the change in kinetic energy, so this must be the final kinetic energy, and this must be the initial kinetic energy. So in general, the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. All right, two for two. Let's see if we can get this third one. What about elastic potential energy? We've got to do a little more work here because we haven't talked about a spring force yet. So let's talk about Hooke's Law, which is a model for a spring force. It's got some details for us. It says the force that a spring exerts on an object is minus kx. Minus because it's going to act opposite to the extension or compression of a spring. So if you stretch out a spring and let it go, that spring is going to snap back together because the force the spring is exerting is to pull it together. If you push it in, it's going to pop out. It's always in the opposite direction of what you've done to it. That compression or extension is this x. The more you extend it, the harder it is to extend. An interesting part of springs, at least springs that are hooky and that obey this. And then the spring constant is a measure of how difficult it is to stretch or compress a spring. It's measured in newtons per meter. It basically says if I need to stretch a spring by one meter, how many newtons of force do I need? Now, doing the work for this is tricky because it's a changing force. If I look at this, as I begin to stretch it, x changes. As x changes, the force that I need changes. So we're going to need a trick here. We're going to consider the average force in stretching a spring and then use the average force as though it's the force the whole time. Because that's kind of what averages are supposed to do. So if I stretch a spring like so from its rest length to its rest length, plus a distance x, so I've stretched it a distance x now. Here, the force needed to stretch it is zero. Once I've got it out a distance x, the spring is pulling in with a distance, with a force minus kx, so I have to exert a force positive kx in order to keep it there. because so The spring is pulling in this way. I pulled it in the positive x direction, so it's pulling in the negative x direction. Meanwhile, I've got to be pulling still in the positive x. So the average force on the spring is nothing plus kx, because we go from the force by the spring to the force on the spring, which is a Newton's blank law pair. If you answered third law, you're absolutely correct. Um, so that's just 1 half kx, which means the work done on the spring, I'm going to say is the average force times x, how far I pulled it. The average force 1 half kx times x, or 1 half kx squared, which gives me 1 half kx squared as my change in elastic potential energy. Or the general elastic potential energy. Because this went from that, initially it was 0. So this is my us final, my us initial. Um, anything else? Well, we can think of friction as an external force doing work. Uh, so wor work is equal to minus fkd. Specifically, this is kinetic friction. We didn't really talk about types of friction too much this year, but if you want to be particular. Um, just a constant force doing work, so Fd, it's always negative because it's always in the opposite direction of motion that friction acts. Or, or we can think of friction as increasing the internal, specifically thermal, energy of our system. Works either way. Now, why would we ever want to do this? Uh, remember a little while ago we had a 5 kilogram object held 2 meters above the ground. How much gravitational potential energy did it have? Remember how I didn't actually answer that question? Look all the way back up here. Oh god, all the way back up here. Yeah, remember we had numbers and then we uh, didn't use them? Let's use them now. But let's make it a little more interesting. What if I want to know how fast it's going just before it hits the ground? So if I look at this, I can see that I have a mass, I have a height, I have how fast. So I'm get some stuff about, you know, I'm going to look at this thing and make a bar graph for it. I'm starting two meters above the ground, I'm not moving, no springs, nothing doing work-wise. Afterwards, it's at the lowest point, still no springs. As far as I know, nothing got hot. So. Instead of leaving this with bars and made up numbers, this gravitational potential energy, 
is, I'm going to use my expression for it. I know this is my initial height, technically. My kinetic energy, I'm going to use my expression for it, my final velocity. I don't have a final height, and I don't have an initial velocity, so we could probably leave it just as y and v, which I'm going to do because, you know, cut down on subscripts. This is all that we're doing, is we're just moving from bar graphs to using these expressions. So mgy equals one-half mv squared. My initial energy, my final energy have to be equal because that's what conserve, that is what it means to conserve energy, that my total, my ener total amount of energy stays the same as I move along. I'm um, doing a little bit of math, dividing both sides by m gets me down to here. And then I'm going to multiply that 2 right on over, take a square root of this whole thing, and plug in my numbers. I know that y is 2 meters, I know that g is 9.8 meters per second squared, and so v should be like 6.3 meters per second. You'll notice that root 2gy should look familiar from when we did free fall problems when we're dropping things. It's all going to work out the same way. It's the same physics. Now, what if, to make things interesting, it falls onto a spring of spring constant k equals 10 to the fifth newtons per meter. So remember, scientific notation, 10 to the fifth is a 1 with 5 zeros. So how far will the spring compress? All right, so situation I got. Ball falls on the spring, spring squishes. So initially, it's still not moving, no springs to start, no work that I'm looking at. Finally, not moving, no height to speak of, nothing heating up, so just all gravitational to all elastic. Should point out, these things can get more complicated than this. You could have many types of energy at once. I've just done a couple of simple examples to get you started. So again, mgy to 1 half kx squared. And let's see what we got here. Well, mgy equals 1 half kx squared. You can move this 2 on over. And then let's see, you're going to divide by k. And then I guess another square root. Now at this point you may be forgetting numbers, so let's refresh ourselves. We know, don't want to spoil this, m is 5 kilograms, y is 2 meters, k is 10 to the 5th newtons per meter, or 100,000 newtons per meter. So I put all that in, and I get 0.04 meters, or 4 centimeters. Now, one thing you might be wondering, wait a second, if this was 2 meters above the spring, this is now 4 centimeters below where we said the zero was. And you're right, we really should have an itty bitty tiny bit of negative gravitational energy here. But because 4 centimeters is sm so small compared to 2 meters, we're just going to say that we can kind of let that one slide. It's always good to go back and check these things and justify them. The amount of energy that we're neglecting here is a small amount, but it still matters. And so if we had to be really careful about it, we'd want to take it into consideration. Also, it's unlikely that we could ever collide with a spring and not actually produce internal energy due to friction and heat and such. But, you know, ideal worlds. So, this will get you started on moving through the new stuff. We're just trying to get some, you know, added detail into our discussion of energy. Have fun.